Uh, my name is Jason Wong. I'm here uh, today on May 25th, uh, 2010 um, in San Jose, California. Uh, I'm with the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation and uh, we are interviewing uh, Hong An uh, Nguyen uh, as part of the 500 Oral Histories Project. Hi, uh, could you please state your name, uh, your birth date, and uh, your birth city for the camera? My name is Hoàng Anh Nguyen. I was born in December 7, 1966 in South Vietnam. Okay. Um, do you remember uh, which particular city it was? Saigon. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess we can start um, with a bit of uh, family background. Um, uh, do you remember what your parents did? Um, yeah, my parents was born in uh, Vietnam also. And um, my mom came here with me. My dad passed away. He worked for the old regime. So after 1975, he was sent to the um, re-educated camp. And he was sick when he got out, so he passed away. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when you were when you were a small child, though, um, what was your father in the military? Yes, I didn't remember to see my father um, around at all. Once in a while, he showed up, and I I didn't have any um, good memories or any um, close relationship with my father because he's in the war all the time. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, and uh, during that time period when you were smaller, um, did, did you ever go to school or did you mostly stay at home? Um, my parents sent me to school, but uh, after 1975, um, my father was sent to the re-education camp, so uh, my family really struggling with uh, surviving. So I didn't get to go to school. Um, I went up to 10th grade, that's it. And then I tried to escape the country mm -hmm. in and out. So I couldn't finish school back in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, did you, um, so did you ever have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have two brothers. Um, one is two years younger than I am. And my little brother was um, 10 years younger. Um, during the so during the war, it sounds like you grew up during the war. Do you remember um, sort of what happened? Did you ever hear any of the bombing? Yes, 1975. Because I live um, near to the palace that the president lived, so all of a sudden we was in the shower and then we heard the bombing and it was so scary. I remember my brother and I was running naked to look for my parents, but at that time, only my grandma was at home. So we had like a little um, tunnel built under our house. So we all went underneath because it, it was so um, terrifying with all that noises of the bomb. And um, yeah, I remember that. I, I still remember that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, um, why was, how was, uh, I mean, why was there a tunnel under your house? Um, because um, my um, grandparents um, built it, you know, because we live so close to the president place and we never know what's going to happen. A lot of people try to attack the place and bomb in the place. So we have that, like a safe place to rescue, you know, in case just like a lot of fighting or bombing. So we store the food and something, so at least we can last for a couple of days down there. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Um, and so when did, when did you hear the news on uh, April 30th? When did we hear it? Mm -hmm. um, actually, at that time, I was little. I, I was born in 1966, so that was 1975, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like nine years old, I guess. And... Um, I didn't know anything about uh, what's going to happen. Like I said, I and I, my brother was, was taking a shower, and we heard this airplane and a bomb, and, you know, like, boom. And it was so scary. And my grandma said, come on, come on, let's go down the tunnel. And then everybody ran. Everybody ran, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
How long did you uh, stay down there? We stayed there for like uh, two days and two nights. Um, and uh, during that time, did you hear anything going around outside? Uh, no, the, we didn't. We still hear the bombing, but it's not that loud. You know, it, it, it wasn't that scary like when we were upstairs. Yeah, now there was like, uh, and then my grandma brought uh, the clothes out so we can put on some clothes. And then my mom came home from the market because she was out there, um, you know, in the market. Um, did she tell y'all what it was like? Yeah, my mom came, uh, was really scared. She said, oh, everybody was running and throwing stuff away, and they wonder where's my dad. You know, he's supposed to come home and get us to go, um, you know, to the ambassador because there's an airplane there can take us. But I have a little product. I think he's a newborn, and my mom didn't want to go. He's, and I heard that uh, my family was arguing, like, no, you should go, you know. And then my mom was crying with my brother, like, no, I don't want to take my little babies out there. It's such a big mess out there, a lot of people out there. Mm -hmm. It's a tragedy out there, you know. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so when you came out uh, two days later, uh, what did you see? I came out two days later. What I saw was, um, um, because I live on... I have like a three stories and my house right in the city. So I looked down on the street. All the street was like filled up with all the books and the stuff. People have been thrown out the stuff from their house because um, I heard my grandfather was saying, oh, the communists going to uh, come in and, and check it. And, you know, everybody have something, they just throw it out. So you see the whole block was like all the stuff. Yeah. And then you saw some people digging to it, you know, to try to pick up the stuff too. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, did you, do you remember uh, seeing any of your neighbors? No, I didn't remember. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. And uh, during this whole period, your father, he never came back? Um, I didn't remember seeing him. Um, but I heard my family talking about him, that he tried to bring our family you know, um, to get on the helicopter, but then after that, I didn't see him at all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, did you ever, would, did any of the uh, North Vietnamese soldiers, uh, do, do you have any uh, memories of, um, of them? Um, I remember like about, um, yeah, I remember my grandmother took me to see the marching band yeah, where the president lived, the palace, and then they start marching in. And I remember we stay there with a lot of people to watch them march in. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool, though, at that time when I was little. I was like, wow, first time in my life I saw a lot of um, soldiers, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so after, after April 30th, there, um, when... Um, did how did li how was life like did you return back to school um after 1975 um yeah i think we went to school but i remember at that time was really tough because um we couldn't do any business and uh, everything changing so uh, i i it was really tough I, I just went to school at that time. I didn't have to worry, but I can see my family, you know. Um, uh, we have a business, but then now it's all shut down. So I guess there's no more business. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, was your father in hiding or was he already? Uh... He was already taken to the uh, camp, mm -hmm. you know, the re-education camp. They mm -hmm. said they would send him home in a short time, but then... Um, yeah, they took him and he went for like, um, I think, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he went for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I remember to go to education camp to visit him twice. Yeah. Did your mom take you? Yeah, I went with my mom, my older brother, not my little brother because he was so young. And I remember we uh, bought some foods and we cooked some, we packed in the cane, you know, in the container and brought it for him. But I remember it was very far. We have to uh, go in different buses to get there. 
really long trip. How long was that trip? It's like the whole day. Yeah. Um, did uh, how did you feel about that when you when you saw your father? Um, I was crying. You know, it's like because I, like I say, when I was young, I didn't see him that much. He was always uh, uh, away from home, and now um, I got to see him, and he in, in jail actually. And he was very skinny, mm -hmm. and he misses us. Mm -hmm. Actually, he misses us more than we miss him. I mean, that I miss him because I didn't remember him being around that much. Yeah. What did you feel when you saw the, the rest of the camp? Um, I didn't see that much of the camp. I just, because they took us to the visiting area, so it looked very nice in the visiting area and we just waited there and then um, they went to get my father. So he went in and um, he spent some time with us. What did he say? He said he missed us and um, he said try to um, study hard, try to help your mom when I'm not around. Um, how uh, your brother, how did he feel? I didn't remember to um, look at my brother at that time. I just, um, yeah, I didn't, I think he was crying too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, my brother was very close to my dad. He got to spend some time with my dad more than I do, not me. Um, when y'all left, uh, what, what did your mother, what was she like? You mean left my country? Um, no, uh, when, when, you, uh, visit, when you went to visit your father, um, how, how did your mother, did um, you? I saw my, bro my mom and my dad was crying a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, do you feel that, um, I mean, so you went to visit him twice? Yeah, only twice. Mm -hmm. After that, I think they transferred him to another place too far that we couldn't go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that that second time that you went, um, did did he? Do you remember what he said to you? Um, I remember he say, um, "Next time, maybe we don't have time to see each other." Um, um, you just have to remember me by try work really hard, you know. Yeah, he say that. Mm -hmm. Um. So after after you left uh, after you left the camp that time, um, when you went home, uh, what I mean, what what were you feeling? I felt like um, it's. It's on, on my shoulder now. I have to do everything. I have to uh, finish school. I have to go to work. I have to do stuff that um, to help um, out my mom and to take care of my brother. Because I feel like my father just told me, like, uh, you take that role for me now. You know, uh, you be a, the older one and the the bigger, more responsible in the family. Yeah, I, I feel like it's like something he said to me for the last time, you know. Yeah. How old were you at that time? Um, at that time, I believe I was like um, 12. Hmm. All right. Um, and so when did, uh, when did uh, your family, when did y'all try to, um, try to, uh, figure out that uh, Vietnam wasn't uh, a place where you could stay at. Oh, you mean leaving Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because after that time we left um, the camp and uh, we came home and it was really tough to uh, do the business. We used to have like a um, shoe uh, shop and now we couldn't do it anymore because um, they came into our house, they collected everything, they investigate everything, and uh, we came down to zero. That means we don't have any more money. 
and uh, my grandfather got a heart attack and died. And um, my uncle was taken to jail. So my family actually is broken down. You know, all the men was gone. And here we only woman, my grand grandmother, my mom, me, and two of my younger brother. So uh, my mom said, um, uh, we have to go. We need to get out of the country. Maybe you can um, find some freedom. You can go to school. And you can make some money and send it back and help us. But if we stay here this way, we're going to be starving. <laughs> so my mom started arrange with the people that she knows. And I saw she had like the gold stack. She collect them all and then give it to the people and arrange for us to go. And I have to escape like more than 10 times to go and um, on the trip, you know, like um, by boat. But I didn't make it until 1984. We start escape like 19, um, 1978, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was uh, the first uh, the first attempt like? What did you feel when when you tried to leave? Very scary, pretty scary because um, uh, I went by myself, and they took me to the suburb very far from where I live, and I have to get on the bus by myself. Somebody took me, but then uh, I don't know that person, and then I have to go to the village to stay there, some stranger house, I don't know. And I was little, so got pretty scared. And then in the middle of the night, they took me out in the field, pretty empty, pretty dark, and I just had to walk. Um, it w I remember it was so muddy, and I had to walk with my bare feet. And it was scary because it was dark and you have to go, but you don't know where you're going, you know. Yeah. And then, um, so they got me to, um, I saw a lot of people by the riverside. And then one of the men just grabbed me and dragged me, walked me on the water through that uh, little uh, boat over there. And he was touching me to see if I have any jewelry so he can take it off. At that time, I didn't have any jewelry with me. But then uh, some of the lady had that experience, so they shared with me. At that time, I, I realized he did that, but then I didn't know he was looking for something. So when we got on the boat, and then uh, that boat took us to another island and, tell, and told all of us to get down. So we got down the island, and then we stayed there, and the boat disappeared. And then later on, like the end of the day, there's a little, um, what do you call that? It's like very, it's like a, it's a small boat, like for two people. Mm. It's come out one by one and say, hey, if you have um, gold or money, get on, and we take you back to the land. So at that time, we realized that, oh, that was a trap, you know. We're not going to go anywhere now. They took us here, and now we have to go back. Yep, that was my first experience. It was so scary. How did you get back home? Oh, because at that time, I went, we were waited because all the people on the boat, they have to pay gold and money to go. And I didn't have any gold or money with me, so I have to be waited for the last one to come. So then there was another two ladies, um, they also waited for the last one too. And it was so funny, now I think it's so funny, but at that time we were so scared. She said, okay, none of us have money, so we cannot pretend like we have some money. And then we are the last one, so they're going to take three of us. And by the time it gets to the, the land, and we are going to run for our life, because we don't have anything to give to them. So um, I said, okay, we have to do it, otherwise we can get stuck here, you know. So we did that. So we get on that little boat, the man came and said, hey, ladies, uh, you are the last one. You have some gold, 
said, no, we don't, but we have some money and some um, clothes. If you want to take, she said, I take everything. So I said, okay, so just take us back. So then when he paddled and then he got to the land, we all ran for our life. We, we threw our bags there, though, our bag of clothes and whatever we had. We just ran without shoe. Yeah, we ran, and then we stayed in the field for like the whole night and the whole day. Next day, I remember it was so hot. I never stayed in the middle of the field before, you know. It was so hot. We lay there, and um, I remember the two uh, lady were saying, we have to wait until dark because we go right now. People will know. So, and then we wait for the next day. I was hungry, and it was hot. So then at nighttime, we went to the neighbors, you know, the people that live around there, and asked them if we can have clean clothes and... Uh, we told them that uh, we tried to escape and we couldn't make it and we survived, so please help us. And they was very kind. We didn't have anything to offer, but they gave us clean clothes and uh, we got on the bus. Uh, they gave us some money too. So we got on the bus and then uh, we got home, yeah, safely. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess they was our angel at that time because if we didn't have clean clothes, we didn't have money we couldn't get back hmm. yeah when your mother saw you what did she say she was crying she was like i thought you was out there what are you doing here i was like, i don't know what's happened you know we all went and they just dumped us on the island and we're lucky to get back without uh, being caught because some people um was caught but, you know and put in jail yeah, yeah. so then I was scared, we was crying, and then for after a while, for a few months, my mentality is like, okay, again, and say, okay, it's time to go again. My mom say, my mom say, it's time, we need to go, you know. So there's, there's another trip, so another attempt. Just like that, one after another for 10 times. Mm. And I was captured by three times, put in jail for three times. When, I mean, so the first time you went to jail, uh, which trip was that? That was the one um, after that one. Yeah, mm. after that one. Mm. And uh, I remember it was in 19, uh, 1980. And uh, did they uh, did they release you? Yeah, they released me after two weeks because I was little, consider a minority, consider a minor because um, I think at that time they say if you are younger than fourteen years old, we're gonna free you after two weeks. So at that time I was, mm. yeah. And I at the second time, I think the first time I was in jail, I took my little brother with me. So he was minor too, so two of us got out early. Yeah. Um, and so your mom, she was always trying to get y'all out? Yeah, she always tried to get us out, and she wanted to stay behind and see just in case we was captured or whatever, so she can support us, you know. So always one person to stay back. Mm. Yeah. How did she find the money? Um, uh, because... Um, before the war, we consider very wealthy, so we have, you know, some gold, and then we use that to escape, yeah, hmm. to to pay for our trip. But then after a few years, everything gone, and then we was really struggling. Yeah, we have to find a way to survive and try to escape at the same time. So. But um, thanks God, you know, uh, always help us. Whatever we try to do, we do pretty good at it, you know. I remember after that, my mom tried to sell the clothing, you know. So she had some tailor making the clothes, and we were selling. At first, we were selling shoes, we were selling makeups, and then we were selling clothing. So whatever money that my mom collected, she bought gold 
and then we used to go to, you know, leave the country. When did uh, when did you hear the news about your father? Um, when I was in United States, 1984. Um, I got to United. I, I got to the refugee camp in 1984, and um, and um, I got to United States in the end of 1984, and um, I think. At that time, I heard my father uh, got home already, but very sick, and uh, he needs some medication, and we don't have money at that time because I just came to this country, and I was young. I had to stay with foster family, and those foster family, they were poor too, so they tried to get the money from us. Uh, we were sponsored by ch uh, Catholic charity, we stay in New York with foster family, and we supposed to get our allowance money and um, clothing, all of that, but we didn't get any of those because I think the foster family was poor and they tried to make some out of it, you know, take away the money or the clothing because I always wear the handout clothes from their children, you know. So that's how I heard my father was sick, but I don't have any money to send it to him. How old were you when you when you came over to the U.S.? I came to the United States uh, in 1984. I came on Thanksgiving, 1984. And my birthday is in December, so it's like a few more days and I will be 18. Um, suppose, like, if you're 18, you know, you're not supposed to stay with foster family, but I go with my little brother. At that time, he was only 10. So the two of us stay with foster family. Um, and uh, which part of, um, or so you all flew in from uh, which refugee camp? Um, I went to uh, Cuckoo Islands and I stayed there for two weeks and then a huge, huge ship from Indonesia came, took us, yeah. So we stay in refugee camp in Indonesia. It's called Galang for like seven months. Um, and during those seven months, what did you do? Um, I volunteer. Um, I volunteer to do at the radio station because they like the way I talk. So then I got to do some of the announcement at the radio station and um, it's not much of the money but it's like you get to see people you communicate and I went to uh, study English and then I went to uh, the Buddhist organization they have all the youth you know we hang out with each other so it was kind of fun. I was scared you know because I was by myself with my little brother I had to take care of him for the first time in my life, I have to be away from my family, and I was on my own. And I was bullied by a group of people on, on my boat, too. So it was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And on the, the refugee camp, too. Mm -hmm. But always good people there to help us, so I was okay. So the, the last trip uh, where you were successful, um, when your mom sent you out that time, uh, what were you thinking? The last trip? Mm -hmm. The last trip, I remember um, I went to the bus, as usual, and went to the suburb. Um, I didn't feel like um, this time we're going to make it because we went so many times. We came back, so I just said, oh. It's another attempt that we need to do it, you know. But I didn't think I was going to make it. Yeah. And you so were... um, it's really hard because you was all excited to go. And then you got captured. You came home, you know. You really disappointed. But then there's nothing. I couldn't go back to school because they kicked me out of school. I absent for so many days because those times that I went away and in jail. So 
I miss my friends. I miss, you know, all of that that I supposed to do, hang out with friends at school. I, I didn't get to do any of that. Just waited around and for the next trip to go. And yeah. Yeah. It, it was kind of, I don't know. It, it was, I didn't have a good childhood at all, but I remember all of that. Um, and uh, so you arrived in New York with your brother, and um, yeah. and this new family inside of this new this new nation. Um, did you? I mean, did they try to put you in school? Oh yes. Uh, good thing about that with the foster family is I don't have to worry any things. All I have to do is just go to school. Even cooking, I don't have to do. Even washing my clothes, I don't have to do. They do everything for you, you know. Um, all you have to do is focus on your study. Go to school, come back, eat. Maybe help out clean the tables. I remember I have um, two Cambodians foster brothers, one Mexican foster brother, me and my brother. So five of us foster children. So all the guys got to do dishes and clean up. I didn't get to do anything. I was the only girl, yeah. Did, um, I mean, when you were in school, did you feel, I guess, how did you feel with the other American kids? I was lost. <laughs> I didn't understand anything they say, even though in my country I learned some English, but when I came here, I couldn't hear what they saying. I couldn't get anything. I, I couldn't speak. It was really, um, it's just an awful experience. I don't know how to describe, but I remember I went to school, I came home, I got ahead of it. Because you have to listen all this talking all day long and you didn't understand anything. And then you get some looks, you know, from the American, you know, look at you and it's like, I don't know. Because the place I stayed, there wasn't any Vietnamese at all. I didn't see any Asian at all. I saw like all Caucasian and they all wear braces. At that time I came to the school, I didn't know that was braces. I said, like, what happened to their teeth, you know? High school, they all wear that. Yeah, now I know it's braces. Um, were your teachers nice to you? Very nice. I have a very nice ESL teacher. Her name is Mrs. Wiso, Kathy Wiso, I still remember her name because she's the one that taught me how to learn um, English, taught me to understand. And she's the one that realized that I don't have the warm clothes to wear in the winter time. So she tried to contact my foster parents and asked and she found out and then she called Catholic Charity. They came down and investigated and they found out that we didn't get the clothes we supposed to get, we didn't get the allowance we supposed to get. So they terminate that uh, foster family. They, they're not allowed to do that anymore. So they move all of us to different families. So then they move me and my brothers to another families and we get treated better. We get our allowance money and they bought clothes for us and they give us more foods. At that time, I had extra money to send back to my um, family. But at that time, unfortunately, uh, my father already passed away. Yeah, that's when I heard 1989. That's when my father passed away. He got so sick because he didn't have money to, um, to get treated in the hospital. So he, he went to look for some... Um, um, you know, like uh, use the herb to, um, yeah, they give him some kind of herb and they say, uh, uh, what, he has some kind, I don't know, he got out from the camp and all his body was swollen, really swollen with water and, yeah, they say something wrong with his liver. He got beat up in the jail a lot, so... Uh, his body are tortured and wounded. Um, and this, uh, this new family, um, I mean, being with this new family, like, uh, how, did, how did your life progress from there? I felt more love because uh, 
they do care for us. And um, I feel more confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at least we don't go to sleep hungry. And um, so, how long did you stay with this family? I stay until um, 19, I think 1990. And that's when my mom came. She's the last one to escape our country. And she got to arrive to Japan. And that's when, in Japan, I think her life over there is better than um, our life in the refugee camp in Indonesia because I remember when we were in the Indonesia, we were so hungry, we didn't have any money to spend, and they give us like dry fish to eat. You know, life is rough there. But my mom in Japan somehow she sent out like a luggage of clothing and camera, then you know. So I guess she was happy over there, and she have some extra money to send it to us. So I remember I received two luggages like that from her from Japan. And after that, she came to reunite it with us in 1990. So that's when um, we got out of the foster family. We moved to upstate Buffalo. Yeah, so we lived with my mom. And then I graduated high school up there in Buffalo. And then um, I got a scholarship to go to college. So then... I chose a school in New York, so I went to New York. Um, which, uh, which school was this? I went to uh, New York uh, Institute of Technology in Long Island. Yeah. Um, okay, I think uh, we'll, we, we need, okay, I guess uh, we'll start with something. Um, when was the first time you had ice cream? American ice cream. I don't remember ice cream, but I remember when I first came to the United States was on Thanksgiving, they order pizza, cheese pizza, and I look at it. When they lift it up, I saw the string come. I said, ew. I, I didn't know what is this, but I don't like it at all because I remember back in my country, my father always forced me to eat the, the brain of the pig. He said it's healthy, and I remember it's white and it's like that. So when I saw that, I'm like, no, I'm not eating that. And they said, no, this is good. This is American food. This is really good. You gotta eat. So I remember that, you know. And then the turkey, because Thanksgiving, that's my big impression. I said, wow, what is that creature? How come it's so big? And they make it so beautiful, frowny, and, you know. I don't, I don't remember about ice cream. <laughs> um, okay, I guess uh, we can start back um, with, uh, with uh, your college experience. But um, at this point, um, did you feel fluent in English? In college? Mm -hmm. When you first went there? Um, yeah. Actually, when I moved to Buffalo, I did pretty good. I was on a student, you know. I graduated with, um, you know, like honor students, and then I went to college, and at that time I, I felt more confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did I, you. I, I understood. Yeah. Did you make any more American friends as you, clo as you uh, were getting close to graduation? American friends in, in uh, high school? Um, I didn't remember I have American friends in high school, but I remember I had it in college. Mm. Um, so uh, when, when you went to college, um, I mean, how did you decide on what you wanted to study? Oh, I know exactly what I want to study because I know that um, English is my challenge. And I was good in math and science and chemistry. So I'm saying, okay, I'm going to study for those. So I look at the curriculum, whatever, that need, require a lot of those. And now I'm like, okay, I'm going for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't have that much choice. Like, oh, I like to 
be this or that because I I don't feel confidence in my English so I want to make sure I do well so I I, I guess I pick uh, chemical engineering <laughs> Um, what were most of your friends like in college? My friends, um, I make some friends, actually they have like uh, international students there. So I make a lot of friends, I make friends with a lot of Asian people. Actually I was very popular in international clubs, so it was fun. And all these people, they were so rich, they came to study master degree and they, they came from another Asian, Asia you know, country, but they're very rich, very nice too. I felt like this is where I belong, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I finally have some friends and I get engaged with them, activities and do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm undergraduate, but <laughs> I get an international clubs and mm -hmm. have some good time. Yeah. Um, when you graduated from college, uh, did your mom and your brother come? You know what? We didn't have money to buy the airplane ticket, so I didn't stay for my graduation. That was pretty sad. Now I look back, um, I just finished school and then um, at that time my mom already went to California and uh, my mom and my brother did, didn't have money to go there and plus if they go there we don't have money to spend for the hotel and stuff we don't know anybody there mm. so I just finished my classes and then I took off I didn't even stay for the graduation mm. I remember I went to the studio and take picture with my cap and gowns but I never bought um, cap and gown from the school and I never attend the ceremony so later on my brother one day graduate, I went to that ceremony and I felt that, you know, it's really important and I miss it that, yeah. Um, why did your mom move out to California? Because, you know, Buffalo, it was so cold. You remember, I remember at that time we took the bus and we had to wait for the bus like an hour, it was blizzard, it was windy. It was so freezing. The snow was up to your knee. You, the clothes you wear, you know, it's not warm enough. Yeah, it, it was terrible up there. And my mom, she couldn't stay in the cold. So um, after we finished high school, she said, why don't you go to some warm area with me? You know, I have some friend in California. Let's go. And then I'm saying, but I want to go to New York. I don't want to go to California because New York, at least I stayed there when I first arrived, so I had some experience. I feel more comfortable. I don't want to go to another state that I've never been there. So then my mom went to California with my brothers and then I stayed in New York. Do you feel that uh, when you finished uh, your college education, um, do you feel that uh, your father influenced, uh, influenced you in your decisions? Um, yes, somehow, because I remember when I was little, he always expected us to be the first and the second in the class. If we're the third, we get spanked really hard. So we got scared, freak out. So, so when I was in college, I'm like, you know, I remember him. At that, when I was in college, I, I knew that he passed away and I cried a lot. I missed my same. But then I say, well, it's time to move on and to um, remember him. I'm going to do well in school and he will be happy to see me get an A. Yeah. Okay. Um, so after you graduated um, with your degree, what did you do? After I graduated, I moved to California because my mom wanted me to be with her. Mm. And plus, when I live in New York for a while, I develop arthritis because it's what you call. At that time, I didn't know I have arthritis, but I just felt the pain in my body, and I have to suffer to the uh, winters, and it's really painful. I think like, no matter how much clothes I put on, I still feel really painful inside out, you know. 
and um, my mom said, no, go to California. You have family, mom, brothers, and uh, at that time, I think my mom rented the house. We never lived in like actually a house when we moved out of our country. So I want to feel that, you know, like a family again. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I moved to California, 1992. Mm -hmm. It's when I graduated. Did you uh, find a job out there? Um, uh, I didn't find a job at that time. We need to find a place to stay first because when I moved to California, my mom stayed with a friend. And then uh, I realized where my mom stayed was nothing to do. So I said, we want to move to San Jose. So I remember we moved to San Jose. We were driving in my brother's car with no car insurance. And the car, you can hear all the noises. I'm afraid something gonna falling apart when we were driving from Stockton to San Jose. And I remember I was standing in the phone booths for like hour after hour, calling through this um, magazine looking for a house. I mean, a room to share. Hey, you have a space available, you know. At that time, I think they rented for three hundred a month. Yeah, we had to use the public phone. I remember that. Um, and um, at this point, were your brothers, I mean, because you had uh, one who was two years younger than you, mm -hmm. um, where was, was he working? Was he trying to help? With? Uh, my brother at that time, yeah, his work, he came to the United States before us. He escaped by himself, he came before us, and uh, he's the one that helped us a lot. And. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came to San Jose, yeah, at that time he, I believe he joined the Navy. He finished school and then he joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. He graduated from high school and then he joined the Navy. Mm -hmm. And after he joined the Navy for a couple of years, he came back and, um, you know, study, go to college. So I didn't remember he was working at that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, so when your family had settled in San Jose, um, did what what did you do from there? Oh, I got a job as a, a teaching job in a, in a high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I work as a teacher, and um, I still rent a room with my mom. I stay with my mom, and my little brother graduated. And he joined the Navy too. The two of my brothers in the Navy, and our family only four of us. So I stayed with my mom. What were you teaching? I was teaching um, special education, uh, helping with a special ed, special ed. But actually, they want me to do. Uh, I got a job like um, helping, like teaching math, mm. teacher aides in math and and in and, and chemistry. But then later on, the special ed department, they needed people, so, you know, they hired me. But working with special education students is very special, you know. We got to uh, take, be with them and take them on the field trips and uh, learn more about them. It's more like human to human than just a subject, you know, like, like teacher pets in the class you teach and, so. And uh, you've been in San Jose ever since then? I guess. Yeah. Until now. Um, and in the past couple of years, um, I guess, um, have you continued to be an educator? Um, after all these years, I realized something I want to do is um, give back to the community do something more uh, meaningful and give back to the communities rather than um, making a lot of money. So I didn't focus on ma my major, but uh, I volunteer in the communities, do a lot of work in the communities and volunteer as a mom. At that time I stay home and uh, get to know whatever that need in the school of my daughters. And at that time, I found out about Project Homeless Home. And um, 
I was so thrilled. I'm like, this is a wonderful program. And um, I need to volunteer and get involved and can help a lot of people. Because I remember when I was in my country in fifth grade, I had to walk to school every day, and I got a group of girls stop me every day and bully me. They got my bag, backpack and got my um, allowance money or whatever. My mom bought me a new pencil. And they got it. You know, every day I have to pass by that road, and they stopped me, and they got it. So they was bullying me, and I was so afraid I didn't speak up, and uh, I was scared to tell my mom too. So when I volunteered for my daughter's school, I saw Project Cornerstone came, and it's all about anti-bullying. I'm like, bingo, you know. This is what I want to come out of it. That fear that I had when I was in fifth grade is still inside of me. That's when I was first bullying my group of girls and uh, when I was in jail and uh, when I escaped my country, I was captured by Congo, I was in jail, I was bullying by a group of women in jail, you know, like because you're young, you have to do everything. At that time, you, you didn't stand up for yourself because you were so scared and you didn't know what to do. So I was fast. But when I saw Project Cornerstone and I read about it and they came to our school, they talked about it, I, I want to get involved. And I dedicate most of my time for the project. Yeah. What sort of stuff do they do? Um, they recruit parents just like us, volunteer parents. And they train us in different stories. And all the stories have different topics all about bullying and teach the student not to bully each other, teach the student how to stand up for themselves, stand up for their friend, teach the students how to treat nice to each other, teach the student how to um, handle bullying if it's happened to you. Pretty helpful. So they train the parents, train us. And we go into the classroom, we read that book to the students. And then, you know, so the students get the message. And we do different activities in the classroom. Yeah. That sounds really good. Yeah. Um, when did you, uh, I guess, when did you meet your husband and decide that you want to start a family? Um, I met my husband in 1990. We got engaged in 1995. I met him in 1994. We met at the funeral. <laughs> yeah, through a friend and um, funeral. And we went to a funeral of a friend, and somehow, you know, we got to know each other. Yeah. He from the East Coast, too. And he got a job over here, so then we met over here. And we got married in 1990, the end of 1995. So how old are your two girls now? I have a 14 years old daughter and a 10 years old daughter. Hmm. It's so funny because my daughter is a teenager, and right now I have to work with all the teenagers. And I always have to um, tell the parents of the teenager, oh, stay calm, you know, they go through the changes, and we have to be really patient, and um, yeah, that's my job. And sometimes I come home, I get headed with my daughter, too. So, it's... Uh... Do you, um, what, what, what do you hope uh, your daughters uh, would do in the future? Um, I want her to be herself. I want her to be proud of being Vietnamese. Um, I want her to understand where we came from, so she appreciate it and know the history of how she was born here. I told her, whatever you do, just be yourself and work hard, try your best. You don't have to be number one but you try as much as you can and be yourself and be happy. Have you ever fully told, uh, told your daughters um, your, your story? 
Um, actually, um, she's in eighth grade, and one of her projects was doing the biography of mommy. So we worked together for the first time, very close. And my daughter's very good at autistic, so she bought all this um, pages, and she did a beautiful scrapbook, and she built my story out of that. She interviewed me, and she got all the detail about my trip, how I escaped. I mean, I wrote all that in my diary, and my dream was one day I can put it into a book and pass it on to my children. But now, it's her project, so we work as a project, and now all my life is in her scrapbook. And she said, wow, Mom. I didn't know how much you've been through, and um, it's cool, Mom. <laughs> What's your story, Mom? You know, she really thrilled with what I went through. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so what do you hope to be doing, uh, I guess, in the next five years? The next five years, um, what I'm doing now is I build an asset in Vietnamese students. The 41 development assets and project chromosome. What are those assets? Is make sure they um, be proud of who they are and all the good quality in them. You know, all of them have it, and they need to be confident and respect themselves and be success. And um, I continue to build the asset to them. And uh, I hope. There will be no more bullying around. At least wherever I live, the neighbor, I live, the school, I go, my children go to, because this is the message I want to send to other students. You know, be nice, treat each other as you treated yourself, and. Uh, and part of it is we do prevention in drug and alcohol. Um, the more access we build for the student, the lower risk and misbehaviors and alcohols and drugs use will be reducing. So I hope, you know, the school will be safe, the families, you know, strong family, strong foundation, parents, students get together, safe school, safe community. Mm -hmm. I will continue as a community outreach and build more access for students. Okay, um, is there anything which uh, you might want to tell the younger generation? Um, for the younger generation, um, thankful for who you are, um, and always respect your parents, and need to find out where you come from, and should be proud of who you are and uh, try your best and uh, work hard as much as you can and this is a freedom country if you have a dream go for it but remember you have to have a positive identity who you are where you come from and be proud of yourself mm. all right i think that just about wraps it up so we will close it there and